the theme for this talk is a theme from George Orwell's 1984, War is Peace, Ignorance is Strength, Freedom is Slavery, and then the modern touch, Scrum is Agile. And let's talk about what that means. Uh, a, a few years ago, I, and actually I and several other people all came up with the notion of doing a talk called The Death of Agile. Um, and we all came up with this idea all at the same time, this notion that Agile was completely dead. And of course, Agile is not dead, but the things that spurred that talk have gotten me and a lot of other people that I know that do Agile coaching as a job um, to start thinking about how do we deal with the fact that Agile is turning into something that it should never have been. In other words, if you were to talk to the people who were at the original Snowboard Conference, most of them would not recognize what most people think of as Agile as being what they were thinking of as Agile. And that's obviously not a good situation to be in. So the 1984 problem is that Agile is really not Agile anymore. The things that they call Agile are not Agile anymore. So just going through the list, in 1984, the notion of war and war is peace was that they had a perpetual war going on. And they were trying to convince people that the only way that they could have peace in the world is by having a perpetual war going on. And we're seeing that happening in the Agile community uh, in space is that there is a war in the sense of being a core group of people that really understand what agility is and how to make it work, fighting against mostly large corporations, but not just large corporations who want to twist Agile around and turn it into something that looks familiar to them, but has nothing to do with what Agile actually is. So we have a, a, a basic problem then where the basic basic parts of Agile are being twisted into something that doesn't support Agile, but the companies are still saying, but we're Agile companies. So just to give you a couple examples of that is in the Agile world, the teams are self-organizing. It's right there in the Agile manifesto. And a self-organizing team really is self-organizing. A self-organizing team manages its own work. A truly self-organizing team is, controlled, is in control of who's on the team. You get to control who you work with. You get to control when you work, how you go about working. The companies don't want to have that, right? They want to have managers. So I don't know how many companies I've walked into as a consultant where the first thing that I see is that every Agile team has a project manager on it. And that is flying in the face of this notion of self-organization. Uh, project managers is another example. There is no real notion of projects in contemporary Agile. The word project does occur in the Agile Manifesto, but that was written 20 years ago, and we've learned a lot since then. So we don't do projects, we do products. So if we're not doing projects though, if we're focusing on the product as a whole, and just thinking, okay, what work do we have to do to move the product forward? Then why do we need a project manager? There are no projects for them to manage. So this notion of control, this notion of making the teams do what, they, what the management wants them to do instead of what they want to do, all of this really flies in the face of what Agile is. So it brings us back to this war peace thing, is that we have the people in the companies claiming to do Agile, trying to convince everybody else that what they're doing is Agile, when in fact it is not. Now that brings us to ignorance is strength. Is the only way they can pull this off is to convince people that this non-agile thing is actually an agile thing. And there is an entire industry devoted to that, what uh, um, uh, Martin Fowler calls the agile industrial complex. Uh, the certificate mills are the worst offenders here. Scrum Inc., Jeff Sutherland's company, is an abomination as far as I'm concerned, is that what they're peddling is not agile is the, the, even Jeff's book, right, his most recent book, the notion of twice the work and half the time, that flies in the face of what Agile is about. Agile is about delivering value, not about getting work done faster. You can produce twice the garbage in half the time and that gets you nowhere. What you really wanna be doing is producing good quality work that's actually valuable to people, something that you can sell, which is ultimately what we're doing since we're companies. Um, by thinking in terms of speed, we're not doing that. So we have, an, an entrenched industry that is dedicated to convincing people that Agile is something other than what it is. It's dedicated to keeping people ignorant and convincing them that the things that they learn in the course of the training that these companies provide is actually a strength. 
And it's not. Now, there are exceptions. I know some extremely good scrum coaches, for example. The extremely good scrum coaches that I know, however, are not towing the party line as they're talking about how to be agile in their classes, not talking about uh, scrum by the book. So the notion of ignorance and strength then is that you really don't want to be doing scrum by the book. Now, you see this a lot, of course, in our companies, our war is, is peace companies. Uh, one of the, the uh, things that I, again, often see when I come into a company as a consultant is literally every team in the company is doing scrum. Well, how agile can you be if everybody is marching in lockstep doing exactly the same thing? You cannot be rigid and agile at the same time. It's not possible. So if people are rigidly following some process, they are by definition not agile. If you look at truly agile companies, every team is in charge of how it works. Every team does things slightly differently. And yeah, there'll be some scrum teams, but they won't even be doing scrum in the same way. There will be different versions of scrum happening all at the same time. So we have this tension then between what the corporations want us to think agile is and what it actually is. And we have an industry that is designed to support that, an industry that's designed to convince people that agile is something that it's not. Then we get down into freedom as slavery, right? Is that again, that was another, another uh, big brothery technique that was trying to convince people that they didn't actually want any real freedom. And we see that a lot, again, inside of these organizations that are the fake agile, the dark agile organizations, is that they're trying to convince people that, that doing what you want is a bad thing, is the way they say it. Well, freedom doesn't mean that you do anything you feel like, anything that pops into your mind, is that we, we are adults. And we work together and we want to work together in ways that work, of course. So there are always constraints, in other words. When we're talking about self-organization, for example, we're talking about working within the constraints of the system. But the companies that want us to do agile by the book and march in lockstep don't want us to be modifying the processes that we're using in order to make them more effective because they can't control those. They are no longer by the book. So as a consequence, they're pushing this freedom of slavery thing is that you don't really want to be free. You don't really want to improve things. You don't really want to make things better and better and better all the time because doing that might move us out of the equation. If the people that are stopping you from being able to good, do good work are management and you actually have the freedom to say, no, we don't want you guys in the room anymore, go away. People who are in a command control environment are not going to be particularly happy with that. So the, the, the final thing I'll say as we're talking about this is that one of the things that I get a lot on Twitter, I'm on Twitter a lot, and <laughs> probably more so than I should be, but um, the, one of the things that I get a lot on Twitter when I talk about issues like that is people say, well, that's all fine and good in the theoretical world, but in the real world, things don't work like this. And the fact is, is that in the real, real world, things do work like this, is the the, everyone has their own definition of reality, I suppose, based on what they're used to, used to doing and the way they're used to working. But I've certainly experienced agile companies that are truly agile companies that don't fall into any of these traps. It's perfectly possible to do this. And some of those companies are, are pretty good sized, right? There's uh, the, the Spotify, of course, is the poster child for agile. And Spotify has a little over a thousand engineers right now and two or 3000 people in the company. That's kind of a medium sized company, but that's still a pretty good size. It's, it's the size of a division inside of a large, large enterprise and they are fully agile. Um, there are banks that are fully agile. There are uh, medical equipment companies like Medtronic that are fully agile. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of fully agile organizations that don't have any of these problems at all. So saying, well, in the real world, we can't do this is really just saying the company that I work for, is so interested in control that they won't let us do this, which is another issue entirely. So the idea here then is that all of this is for a purpose. And the purpose is agility, which brings me to Scrum as Agile, which is the same kind of double speak that you see in all of four of these other, other uh, phrases, is that Scrum is not really Agile. Any kind of technique that tells you how to do things is by definition not Agile. Agile means flexible. And there's no flexibility in Scrum. If you read through the Scrum Guide, it says specifically that this guide defines what Scrum is, and Scrum exists only in its entirety. And if you leave anything out, or if you change anything, you're not doing Scrum anymore. Now, I don't see that as a problem. I don't see as a, a, that it's a problem to change things and not be doing Scrum anymore. But Scrum itself is not agile in any 
literal sense of the word, in any dictionary sense of the word. Scrum is all about doing things exactly as prescribed by the Scrum framework. And the problem with that is that it doesn't, not, not only is it not agile, but it doesn't really work. Uh, one of the, agile is built on lean principles. And one of the core notions of lean is that practices do not transfer from one environment to another. It's the classic example of that is in the new United Motors plant, the NUMI plant that was in Fremont, California for years. Um, they're not around anymore. Uh, Tesla, in fact, took over the factory that they're in. But the NUMI plant was a very, very successful exercise in building cars. It was one of the best car manufacturing plants on the planet, in fact. And it was a joint effort between General Motors and um, Toyota. Toyota, of course, being a very lean company. And the, what happened with, with NUMI is the, they developed a set of processes that worked extremely well. And General Motors, not really understanding how lean works, said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to document all of these processes. We're going to take every one of these processes and we're going to write them up on paper and we're going to lay down exactly how you should do that. And we're going to take this documentation and we're going to take it back to Detroit and we're going to give it to all of the factories back there. And we're going to say to them, you must do it like this now. In other words, they took a process that was developed in a very kind of organic way. And then they tried to impose it onto the other factories back in Detroit and it did not work. It was a complete and utter failure. And the reason is that practices do not transfer. Or to put it another way, to put it in lean terms, what matters are the principles and the values. And that in order to get a practice framework to work, you have to develop the practice framework yourself around those principles and values. It is not an accident that the Agile Manifesto has only one practice in it, which is continuous improvement. Everything else is either a basic principle or a value. And that's quite deliberate. It's because the only way that you can be successful in an agile kind of context is to develop your own practices based on a core set of principles and values and the principles and values of the organization that you're, that you're working in. And everything is different. Every company has to work in a different way. And the, the, when you start uh, grabbing a canned framework and say, okay, we're going to do Scrum or we're going to do Kanban or we're going to do whatever, it doesn't really matter what framework. Safe is probably the worst one this way because it is the most prescribed. There are the most rules. Uh, it's just not going to transfer. It's that Scrum works great in the original company that did Scrum, right? The original place where Ken Schwaber was setting Scrum up, it worked just fine. But that does not mean that it's going to transfer somewhere else. <coughs> Excuse me. So Orwell here was prescient. Who would have thought that Orwell was a software engineer? But the things that he was talking about in 1984 apply to us in the agile world. We don't want to be working in this way. We don't want to be locked into a specific way of working. Instead, we want to learn the values. We want to learn the principles. And then the third piece is we want to learn the tools. Is to put it another way, agile is really a set of principles, a set of values, and a, and a tool set, a toolbox. Now, when nobody will do everything, nobody uses all the tools. By the same token, the tools will be flexible in the sense that you may adapt the tools to your own personal way of doing things, to your own, own uses, and that, that's fine. Um, but that's all that Agile is. It's not a set of rules. There are no rules. So if you're marching in lockstep following a set of rules, there's no agility in that at all. So. The question then, given all this, is how do we get from here to another place? So let's talk about that for a moment, as I'm gonna, I will erase Orwell here, and we can talk about other things. First thing I'm gonna do here is get some sticky notes up here, is that you cannot work in an actual way without sticky notes. It's not possible. Um, I should say, by, as an aside, before I start talking about practical things, about how you move into a situation where there's actually some agility in your organization, that um, actually physically working together in the same room with physical sticky notes on the wall is the best way to work. Now, that doesn't mean it's the only way you can work. Of course, in the last few months, we've, none of us have been working that way. Um, there are very good tools that you can use for doing sticky note kinds of things. I use two of them on a regular basis. One of them is neuro.com. 
and the other one is mural dot co no m at the end of mural um of course you go out into the world of fake agile the world of dark scrum and you see tools that are um, um, not really useful tools. Jira, for example. Uh, Jira, as far as I'm concerned, is the work of the devil. You do not want to be using a tool that's not designed to work in an agile way. So the thing about Miro and Mural is that these are basically just walls onto which you put sticky notes. So there's a lot of flexibility there. You can use them any way you want in order to get actual work done. They're not trying to force you to work in specific ways. So you have to use appropriate tools. And as far as I'm concerned, the only tool that you need really for doing any kind of agile work is sticky notes. Sticky notes will do everything. Sticky notes and a whiteboard. That's all you need. So if you're being forced into some kind of electronic tool, just stop. Is that the, the tools are, the, the, these are monitoring tools. These are not tools that are helping you do agility. These are, these are ways to get people to be able to spy on you. They also encourage ways of working that are not good ways of working. Is the, the, um, if you look at what happens inside Jira, for example, is people are working, uh, the definition of a story often goes out to pages. Well, a proper story is a sentence or two long. So here we have a situation where the tool is trying to get us and work, work in a way that's not really uh, appropriate for working in an agile way. It's, it flies in the face of what we know about agile ways of working. So there are a couple things that we want to do in any kind of agile situation to try and get a handle on this, to try and get control over the way things work. The first order of business is that before you can improve what you're doing, you have to get a good understanding of what you're doing now. You have to understand the current situation before you can move on to the next situation. And there are several ways of, uh, of doing that. There are um, user story maps, for example, which I will talk about in a moment. Um, but the first thing we want to think about is mapping out the processes that we use in order to get work done. And we can do that using sticky notes. That's the basic idea of sticky notes. So essentially what we want to do is draw on a board the process that we use to get our work done. Is that I do st step A, I do step B, I do step C. Now, processes can have cycles in them. So you could have a situation where from, from this process, you have to go back to an earlier process and there is a cycle in that system. Generally speaking, cycles are a bad idea. Now, this idea of mapping the processes that you have uh, came out of manufacturing. It came out of lean manufacturing. And in the lean world, going back is never a good idea. Cycles are never a good idea because we're talking about factories. So if you are moving down an assembly line, a literal assembly line, and some piece that you're working on, some part has to go back to an earlier part of the assembly line, that's a big deal, and that's bad. Is that that kind of rework is extremely expensive, and you don't want to ever have it happen. You want everything to be moving in a straight line. In a software world, cycles can be reasonable. It's okay to have cycles. But what we want to do is we want to map out the way in which we work and all of the dependency relationships between the things we do and the things that other people have to do. And we wanna map out every step of the product that we're working on from just an idea in somebody's head, right? It's just a, this is a light bulb. This is meant to be a light bulb. <laughs> an idea in somebody's head, um, all the way to a finished concrete product that we can put in a box and deliver to somebody. So the basic idea here is that we want to map out the entire process. Often when people are thinking in terms of working in software, we think of the work as beginning when it hits the development team. And that's not really a valuable way to look at things. We have to look at everything that has to happen in order for the product to move forward because we don't really want to be moving back if we can avoid it. Anytime we need to move back, that's going to add time to the development that's required. So the basic idea is the first order of business is we want to map out our entire process just so that we can look at it. We want to see what sorts of things, excuse me for my dog, what sorts of things go on in parallel. So for example, if two things are happening above each other on the board, that's saying that two processes are happening at the same time, two things are happening at the same time. 
We want things to be moving in a linear fashion as best we can. There will be cycles, of course, but um, generally speaking, we want to minimize those as much as possible. And we want to sit down at, what we're look, at the process that we have and then try and improve it in order to, in order to uh, eliminate some of the things that are going to be giving us grief as we're moving forward. So the first step then is to understand the current situation. We want to understand where we are now because we cannot improve the way we work and we can't improve the way in which we are developing products unless we understand what we're doing now and how it's giving us grief. And of course, backwards is always a red flag in this kind of situation. If something, if, so for example, if we have a development phase and we have a test phase and they're separate and things go from development to test, but then they go from test back to development because we found something wrong, that's a clue. It's a problem. We don't want to be doing that. We don't want things to be moving through this process in a cyclic way. So what we want to do then by looking at this diagram is to try and eliminate cycles, to try and eliminate backwards if we can. We can't always because Agile is an iterative process. So as a consequence, we will be moving backwards occasionally, and that's fine. But um, generally speaking, we want to minimize as much of that as possible. We want to try and make the process as linear as we can get away with. And we won't be able to get as linear as you can get in a factory, but you can get usually a lot more linear than you get now. Is that if you look at the way most companies work, there are lots of little separate silos, each in charge of something. There will be, for example, a, a design silo um, to the left of the development cycle, to the left of the testing cycle. And the silos will interact with each other in complicated ways. If something doesn't work out in test, then it goes back to development. If something doesn't work out in development, then it has to go back into design. And there are, there are very inefficient cyclic things going on in here. So by drawing it out, by diagramming it, you can see how all of these cycles work, and then you can work to eliminate them from your own processes. So what we're looking for is something that is, is as linear as we can get away with, um, which is not fully linear in the software world because, well, it's the software world as we learn as we work, and uh, you just have to go backwards sometimes because that's just life. But our first order of business then is that we want to come up with a situation where we can um, um, get control over our work. In order to get control over our work, we have to understand our work. So that's the first order of business, is, this, is mapping out the processes that we're using now, and then try, try to get rid of some of these backwards pointing things. Now, if you think about the way Agile works, Agile teams should be doing all three of these activities, right? Is that all of this should really be one team doing all the work. And there will be back and forth within the team, but it's not going to impact other teams. So what we're trying to do then is eliminate some of these cycles and eliminate some of these backwards flowing arrows and to try and make things as linear as possible and also to try and understand um, what the entire stream of work actually looks like. So that's the first kind of tool that I would recommend is to map out on a board um, exactly what you are trying to, or not what you're trying to accomplish, but how do you work? What are all of the steps involved in taking an idea and getting it into your customer's hands? What is every step there? And you want to map out every step and you want to try and identify how the flow of work is. And you want to identify in particular when work flows backwards. And then you want to try and organize yourself in such a way that work will not flow backwards if you can avoid it. Because anytime you've got to go backwards, anytime you have to do real work, you have problems. It's a basic lean principle about rework, which is a big deal, is that you spend one unit of time doing the work. If you have to do it over again, there's another unit of time doing the, re, the re redoing. But the time that you're spending doing redoing is time that you could have spent doing something else. So there's a third unit in here. In other words, you lose three X by having to go backwards in this picture is that you don't ever want to go backwards if you can avoid it. So we don't want to have to do work over again. So any process that we come up with that uh, saves us from that. So it saves us from having to move backwards. That's a good thing. So that's the first order of business. We want to get control over the way that the, the work accomplishes. Now let's move on to another kind of diagram. Get rid of these guys. Excuse me. So 
So step one is get control over the work. Step two is we want to figure out what to work on. And the best way to do that is with something called a story map. Now, if you want to put these into scrum terms, you could say that the story map is a way of representing the backlog. Um, in practice, the story, a story map and a backlog are different, are different things, um, mostly having to do with focus. And more importantly, a story map by being a physical map, and I strongly recommend that you do your story maps as physical maps, either on a virtual whiteboard or on a real one, um, is a way of, of um, it, it's small, it's constrained. So the basic idea here is that we want the story map to map out the work that we have to be working on. However, we want to make it physical deliberately because if we don't do that, we end up with so much work that we can't ever get it done. It's a general rule of thumb in an agile world is that the amount of work that you need to do should, um, you should never be looking more than about a month ahead. So if you're working in Scrum and you've got two week sprints, that means you should have never have more than a couple of sprints worth of work in your backlog for the entire set of teams. So um, if stories are small enough, which they should be different, this is really a different topic, so I won't go into it in depth, but in general, your story should be a day or two long, which means that on average, you'll be doing about four stories in a sprint. So if you have five teams, that means you're doing 20 stories a sprint, so a backlog with more than 40 things in it has got, is way too big. And more to the point, the stories that are in the backlog are also probably too big, because by the time you if, you, if you look at what's in the backlog and you look at the work that you're actually doing, um, you'll find that it, every story that's in the backlog has to be split up before it can actually move into a sprint or an iteration or some way of working. So generally speaking, if you've got four or five teams, a backlog with more than about 20, maybe 30 stories in it is way, way, way too big. So there's a basic rule of thumb here then is that you want to keep things small and working with physical story maps helps you do that. So the idea of the story map is a story map is a way of getting yourself organized and getting your stories organized so you can figure out what's important to work on. And we're trying to keep things as constrained as possible. So the basic idea then is that the story map is split up into, into two regions. The one across the top here is called the backbone. And the backbone, um, sometimes what they say about the backbone is the backbone is your epics. Uh, I don't really like the notion of an epic is that the Jira idea that you have a hierarchy of, of uh, organization where you have epics that break up into stories, that break up into tasks. Uh, the real world is not that, not that easy. Is the, generally speaking, a given story might fit into more than one epic, for example. So an epic is really just sort of a broad area of concern. And the, you could say that we have epics, but I would not think in terms of epics at all. I would think in terms of, in a general way, in order to get something valuable into the hands of our users, what big core steps do we have to go through in order to get there, in order to get from A to B? What are the big things that we have to do in order to get something done, right? So if, our, if we're doing a storefront, for example, there's a, there's a browsing stage where you're just looking at things that are in the store. And then there's a decision stage where you're deciding um, what to buy. And then there's a buying stage. And then there's a, 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 a shipping stage, right? There's, there's a bunch of stages here. I'm going to run out, I'm going to run out of of uh, board space, obviously. There would be many, many columns, if you will, effective columns here inside this map. Now, next order of business is you start thinking about, okay, what are the stories? So you put the, you organize the map and then you get some sticky notes out, more sticky notes. And you start thinking, I'll change color here, let's go for red. The, the, you start taking the stories and putting them into the categories where they fit best. There are browsing stories. Right? There are stories that are associated with the way you should browse. And actually, let me make an aside here while I'm, while I'm thinking of it. The word story is not very well understood by many people. A story, from a design point of view, is an activity that happens in the domain. It is something that your end users do in order to achieve something valuable in the domain. Stories do not describe computer programs. Stories describe your users' work. So 
the, anything that's computery, anything that's designed, that's describing implementation is not part of the story. That's, a, again, a separate class. We don't have the time to go into everything. But um, the basic idea is that what we want to have here are domain level tasks, things that the users have to do. So to browse, for example, we're browsing products. We need to do things like find the products that we want to look at. So we might have a find store here. We have to perhaps group the products together based on um, whatever criteria the user is using in order to buy something. Uh, the decision process is going to involve looking at all of the things that we've grouped together and make uh, a decision about what to buy based on some criteria. Um, there will be stories associated with buying. Um, you have to, for example, uh, present a credit card, some sort of way of paying. So as you start working, you'll start moving more and more stories onto this story map, and they'll appear in various places. Some of them will kind of naturally span lines, and that's fine. It doesn't really matter. Um, <clears throat> but basically what we're going to end up with then is a bunch of stories arranged on this map that between them will cover the whole process. The next order of business with the story map is that we're going to put a line across it. Down here for a second. And then we have to do what I just did. We have to move some things below the line and some things above the line. This is the stuff that constitutes a release. So what critical things do we have to do in order for the user to achieve the end that they're striving for? And in the case of a store, I would argue that if you can't find something to buy, make a decision and buy it, you haven't achieved anything. So we want to move up into here the minimum set of stories that we need to implement in order to make that single flow work. And this is our release. These are the things that we should be working on first. So the teams then take these stories and divide them out amongst themselves and start working. So the basic idea then of a story map is that it's a way, it's a two-dimensional matrix of stories. It's not just a list. The fact that you're doing it with post-it notes is a good thing because it forces you to be small, is the story should be a few sentences. We've all seen that Canextra format, as an X, I need Y to do Z. So what we really have then is somebody in some role performing some sort of domain level activity in order to achieve some useful, valuable conclusion. Those are the three parts of the story. And that's really three words on one of these stickies is enough. Three words is enough. What's so all that you really need to be doing, in other words, is you need to be saying, saying, in this role, I need to do this in order to accomplish that. And the, the story stays in that form until right before implementation. So you take the stories, you write them up, you get them on the board, you decide what is critical for one complete flow from the perspective of our end users, and that's what you work on next, everything above the line. In the process of doing that, other stories will occur to you, them, to you add them. In the process of doing this, you'll find that some of the things that you thought you needed to do, you don't have to do, so you put that down here, and something that you didn't think you had to do, you do, and you move it back up, and this is all fine. Right? It's a very dynamic kind of, kind of way of working. But the point is, is that we are organizing the work so that we can allow our users to accomplish something valuable when they are done with the work. And that's the core, really, of Agile, is that we want to be delivering value. We want to be delivering to our users something that they actually find um, useful at the end of the day. And the best way to keep track of that is with some, something like a story map. But the story map also keeps things small. There's only so many stickies you can stick on this board. And the, the uh, goal here, then, is to inject agility into the system by not planning too far ahead. There's a concept in Agile, which I think is an important one, which is the concept of the last responsible moment. And the idea is that you want to put off work until it's not responsible to put it off anymore. To put it another way, if you put it off further than the last responsible moment, the work would not be as good. So generally what that means is you want to delay things until you can not avoid delaying them anymore. In the case of story definition, as we are working on the stories up here, we will find flaws in the stories down here. I can guarantee it. 
Some of them will be unnecessary. We'll have to add new ones. We'll have to change them. So if this is bolted in concrete, we're already not agile because the act of working uncovers problems in our planning. We need to be planning as we are working. So if you put a lot of information in your backlog, if your backlog has hundreds of things in it, then you're not working in an agile way because the vast majority of those things are gonna be wrong. And if you go ahead and start working on them, well, then you're working on wrong things, which nobody, nobody wants to do. We don't wanna be wasting time working on wrong things. So once you get your story map done and you identify the critical things, the last thing you do is you fall down into the agile implementation process, which is pretty straightforward. So let's talk about that for just a couple minutes. We only have a few minutes left, but it will only take me a few minutes to do this. What does the agile development process look like? It's a cycle. It's a very short cycle. You start off with the story on the top. So stories get into the system. We build something. We release it. And I mean release it. When I say release it, I mean get it into the hands of your users. You get feedback. And then you use that to make necessary changes. And you spin around in this cycle until you can't not spin anymore. Excuse me while I get rid of that noise. You spin around in this cycle until you're done. This is the agile development cycle. So the basic idea then is we pick a story, we build it, we release it, we get some feedback, we make changes, and we spin and we spin and we spin and we're done. The maximum, the maximum, maximum, maximum amount of time for this cycle should be a few hours. Which means that the stories that we're working on should be small. It means that we've gotta be able to release to somebody, so we have to have somebody around to release to. Extreme programming has the notion of, a, of an on-site customer, and that's, a, that's so that you can have somebody on-site who you can say, hey, Fred, come over here, take a look at this, tell me what you think. What do I need to change? What's right, what's wrong? And if the actual customer comes over and goes, man, this is great. I wish I had this a year ago, then you're done. And then you move on to the next story. So this is basically our development cycle. So that process that I just described, where you look at the processes that you use and improve them, where you identify stories and so forth in order to figure out what to work on, where you actually do the work, this is what Agile is. Everything else is junk. Everything else that you might read about what Agile is is completely is, is some veneer that was added on top of agile thinking by somebody who had some, some profit <laughs> to make by doing that. So all of the stuff that you read about in Scrum, none of that's part of agile, right? Sprints and backlog, actually backlogs for that matter, and the notions of backlog refinement and, uh, you know, all that stuff, that's not part of agile. That's got nothing to do with working in an agile way. That has to do with working in a Scrum kind of way, but we're not all doing Scrum. So, Basically what I'm saying here then, the thing to take away from this whole talk is that what we're doing is not really agile in any kind of real sense. And more and more when I hear the word agile, I cringe. And that is more and more the case with almost everybody I know who works in an agile way is that agile has come to mean do a, by rote, do a process by rote, learn a process, do it by the book, and that's what Agile is. And that's the opposite of what Agile is. That's a rigid way of working that has no agility in it at all. And it does not let you adapt, right? This feedback and change is at the critical part of any kind of Agile, <laughs> any kind of agile way of working. Is that the, the, uh, if you're gonna be Agile, you've gotta be Agile, you've gotta be flexible. You've gotta be able to change things on the fly as you learn. Agile is all about learning. And this is a way of learning. So we don't wanna be locked in to a specific way of working if we learn a way to work better. So um, the basic idea then, uh, I guess what I'm saying here, just to sum it all up in one sentence, is that everything you know is wrong. <laughs> and Agile is not about specific processes and specific practices, is what Agile is about, is getting 
stuff that's valuable into our users' hands as quickly as possible. And we learn as we work, so we have to be working in ways that allow us to learn and allow us to feed the learning back into what we're doing. And that notion of learning as we work applies to our processes also, is that as we are working on specific processes, we learn more and more, and then we need to be modifying our processes in order to cover what we're learning. So that's pretty much all that I had to say.